I didn't become an active, actual white supremacist until after I had joined the Navy, went through boot camp, and met some people uh, in San Diego when I was stationed here. Chuck Leake is a former airman first class in the U.S. Navy. He was also a neo-Nazi skinhead who lured new members from the naval base where he fixed helicopters. I spent, you know, a long time grooming and recruiting people. I absolutely know that the rank and file in the mil military understand the depth of the problem. More than a third of troops say they've seen white supremacists in the ranks, according to a 2017 poll. And the military still does not specifically ban members of white supremacist groups. The FBI called them ghost skins over a decade ago, skinheads blending into society, slipping into law enforcement to infiltrate and recruit, stir up investigative breaches, spread a tolerance of racism, and jeopardize the safety of law enforcement sources and personnel. We sat down with Chuck at his home in San Diego to find out how he recruited from the ranks and what it will take to root out white supremacy in the military. Chuck watched the January 6th riot from California. As militias like the Oath Keepers and extremists like the Proud Boys attacked the Capitol, he felt partly responsible. That was kind of a gut-wrenching day because, you know, for a long time, um, for a good chunk of my life, I, I was actively seeking something like that, you know, the downfall of the government, um, chaos in America, and collapse of society. As many as one in five of the people who stormed the U.S. Capitol had military experience. Recruiting strategy was get military members uh, for the training, for access to the hardware. Back in 1988, the local news ran a three-part series on Chuck's white supremacist gang. Skinhead and white pride and working class pride and, you know, doing an American pride, those do go together. You're in the Navy? Yes, I am. Aren't they upset with you that no, you're a skin? No. This going on television isn't going to affect your career in the Navy? It might. A white supremacist leader and former KKK Grand Dragon was also featured in that report, Tom Metzger. After the story, he reached out. He tasked us with um, getting as many new people into the group as, as we could. Metzger wanted military insiders like Chuck to help bring about his white supremacist endgame, meaning a race war and a white ethnostate. So they wanted people in positions of responsibility in law enforcement, in the military, uh, in government positions. Mike German was hearing the same things when he worked undercover for the FBI. With the groups I was undercover with, there was talk of how do we get the skills uh, that we want to use to, to create an event uh, so significant that it would spark a race war. Chuck says his recruiting on the naval base had to be subtle. He looked for racists. In the military, you're exposed to a lot of people of color. Um, and you can kind of get a sense with people, white people, when they are less comfortable with that, when it's, when, when they, you know, things they say. And then when people of color aren't around, the, the mask tends to drop, you know? And so we would really um, drive after people who were um, free with their words when, you know. And when he had a certain feeling, he'd bring a potential recruit to a party like this one at Metzger's house on Christmas. Meanwhile, after that news report, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS, found Nazi flyers in Chuck's trash when they came to question him. Obviously, I did not tell the truth. I, I lied about basically everything. Somehow, Chuck kept his job as a helicopter electrician on base. It was actually kind of a shocker when, when they let us off scot-free with no, you know, no repercussions at all. In fact, in the NCIS report, the Naval investigator shows sympathy for Chuck. You know, they were more concerned about whether or not we were safe from, you know, 
repercussions by other people on base and that we weren't doing anything on base. Chuck ultimately served two years in prison for beating a Hispanic man. Specifically with skinheads that have infiltrated law enforcement, the greatest danger is that they get free access to people of color and, and are able to you know, harm them. They all are a threat to our democracy and they all are a threat to my existence. Army veteran Victor Lagoon represents 300,000 vets as the chair of the Black Veterans Empowerment Council. It isn't confronted head on. It isn't confronted consistently. There is no um, significant accountability for it. The most scary thing that's gonna happen if extremists are in the military is that they're learning how to kill. That's Heidi Byrick, an expert on domestic terrorism. She testified before Congress in 2020 specifically about white supremacy in the military. There need to be mandatory reports every year about the levels of white supremacy in the military. So the military is well aware of the problem. They've ignored it for so long, and, and it's really unconscionable. After the Capitol riots, the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, ordered members of the armed forces to revisit their oath and discuss extremism. You know, I've seen this before. I've lived through it as a soldier and as a commander. It's not new to our country, and sadly, it's not new to our military. None of the programs related to getting rid of white supremacists and other extremists are good enough. They're, they barely exist. The military's current policy allows members of white supremacist groups to be in the armed forces, so long as they aren't active white supremacists. Would we let a member of Al-Qaeda or a member of ISIS into our, into our military if, we said, if they said, well, I'm a member, but I'm not active? Why aren't we doing this the same for these white supremacist groups? A Defense Department spokesman says the military is going to update its definition of extremism, and a working group will give Secretary Austin a variety of solutions this summer. Chuck Leak wants the military to own up to its reality. But to root out white supremacy, he says the military needs to hear his story and never let it happen again. A zero tolerance policy for any kind of racial incident would be a good start. When I was in in 1988, they put blinders on and looked the other way, and it's still going on today. 